For most of us, the idea that the Earth's temperature is rising remains abstract. We're not actually feeling the heat. But the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing, and unless we act, it will continue to grow. That's why experts predict that the Earth's average temperature will rise three to 10 times more in the next century than it did during the last, and that the survival of entire communities of plants and animals could be threatened by such a change. How would this happen? Well, look at it this way. Every system has a point at which it becomes unstable. A little push, like a small rise in temperature, can have insignificant effect. But a few pushes in a row can trigger a major system crash. That's the tipping point. There may be one coming soon to an ocean near you. The impact of rising temperature closer to shore is already being measured. In California tide pools, the mix of species is changing as some animals are driven north by warming. But not every creature can relocate. Physiologists George Samaro and Jonathan Stillman wondered what fate awaits those that stay. Well, that was a hot week. That was the hottest week I think we've had here. Could some of these animals already be living at the edge, near some temperature endurance limit? When we entered this field of study, we were sort of in the dark as to exactly when does an organism start to feel the pain, as it were, as, as warming is occurring. And the question as to whether or not a single degree change in temperature can be that stressful, I think it was a question we didn't have the data to answer. The residents of these tide pools are by and large a pretty hardy bunch. They have to be. It's a challenging environment. Life here is an endless series of batterings from the waves, and thanks to the coming and going of the tide, huge daily temperature shifts. Some of these poor things are at 10 degrees one moment, the tide goes down, the sun comes out, they're up at 35 degrees. It's an extremely variable environment in terms of the physical conditions that the organisms see. But even an organism that can handle a wide range of temperatures has limits. We've been recording some extraordinarily high body temperatures. That's got to be stressful to the organisms. Intrigued, Samaro and Stillman decided to see just how much heat these animals can take. In one experiment, Stillman collected several varieties of small crabs that live in Pacific tide pools. He hooked them up to a heart rate monitor, immersed them in water, and gradually increased the temperature. What we're looking for is the point where their heart rate kind of goes up and up and up with temperature, and then it crashes and falls off. To his surprise, Stillman discovered that the crabs that are currently experiencing the biggest daily temperature swings are already just about at their limit. Their hearts stop beating in water only two degrees Fahrenheit warmer than what they currently experience in the wild. If it gets just a little bit hotter, they're going to be beyond their tolerance limit. And when they're gone, Creatures that feed on them will be threatened. That's the nature of a food web. Change at any point tends to ripple through the hole. As Earth continues to warm, some will win and some will lose. We're just now learning who the losers may be and how widely their loss will be felt. Climate experts used to believe that the warm-up after the last ice age was slow and steady. But the Greenland ice cores told a very different story. Instead of gradual warming occurring over thousands of years, the end of the ice age 11,000 years ago came suddenly and swiftly. 
When you look at the long record, the warm up from the ice age to today was not a smooth process. It jumped. You'd be coming along and then boing, the world changed. And the Boeing may have taken 50 years, it may have taken 20 years, some of the Boeings one to three years. And the change is something a third to a half of the whole warming from the Ice Age. Just the world changed. Looking back in time, the last 10,000 years have been marked by dramatic changes, century-long cold spells, and decades of drought. But these were nothing compared to what came before, when average yearly temperatures fluctuated wildly, creating climate shifts within a human lifetime that are nearly unimaginable. If we remember the Dust Bowl, it got dry and the fields blew away and the crops died and people starved or they moved. The Dust Bowl was a change in the weather, a change in the climate that would be barely a blip in the climate records we're seeing. So if you think of the impact of the Dust Bowl on the people living in Oklahoma when that happened, that was a small change. That was not a big change. This is the crucial distinction between climate and weather. The natural disasters we've known, including hurricanes, tornadoes, and floods are weather events taking place in a climate that is basically stable and predictable. But if the climate changed, if the average temperature suddenly went up or down by even a few degrees, it could radically disrupt life as we know it. Well, one way to think of these large changes in climates is, is as if the climate that you find up in the Midwest in, uh, in Iowa or something like that was suddenly occurring down in Texas. The cause of such rapid shifts is a mystery. But some scientists fear there are critical thresholds in our climate that once crossed could trigger the sudden change. What it means is that there may be sort of triggers or thresholds in the climate system so that you can be in this one climate state and you can be changing something, uh, perhaps greenhouse gases, perhaps other aspects of the climate system, and you won't see any change or very much change in climate. And then once you cross a critical threshold or you sort of trip a trigger, if you will, the climate abruptly changes to another state and it catches you by surprise. So you can be sort of monitoring climate and you can be saying, well, there's nothing going on, there's no real changes, uh, we don't have anything to worry about. And then all of a sudden, boom, you've got a problem and it's there and it's sort of too late to do anything about it. So what should we give up today to make ourselves and the planet better off in a few decades? It's a tough question. But it's not unlike choices we face every day. Whenever we put money in a home or, say, in a savings account for a child's education, we're weighing a sacrifice today for something precious in the near future. Global warming is different. It may take decades of effort to put the brakes on rising temperatures. One other difference, what I put into the atmosphere affects you. What you do affects me. The Earth's climate is one big interconnected system. The pressure on industries and governments to do their part will also grow. Ideas have tipping points too. Think of it as buying our children and grandchildren insurance against future climate disasters. It may prove to be one of the best investments we can make for them. How should this new view of Earth change the way you live? I can't tell you that. That choice is up to you.